My name is Dodge Engelman. My name is Lorna Engelman. I uh, came to Panama, I came to the Canal Zone in 1970 for my internship. And having always liked birds, but didn't know anything about bird watching, uh, when a guy invited me to go on a Christmas bird count, I went. And the uh, binoculars weren't in alignment, so I had to put the cap over the objective lens. And it was a lot of fun, man. So after the holiday was over, I went out and bought a pair of $15 Tasco binoculars and started birding. So I guess I started birding January 3rd, or the day of the Christmas camp, December 31st, 1970. I didn't really start birding with binoculars till I met Dodge. And that's when I officially started birding. And that's when I found out that there was a Birds of Panama book, which I didn't know even existed. But I do remember when I was younger, uh, where we lived, seeing uh, blue-black grassquits, and we called it the jump-up birds. We didn't know they had any other name, because they would always jump up. And I remember uh, once taking a walk with my brothers and some other friends in the neighborhood, and we walked into what was forest, very close to our house, and we lived by El Dorado, and all of this was forest. All this area was forest. It was not, you know, there were no tumba muerto, no nothing. And I remember seeing a trogan. I don't remember which one, but I remember seeing a trogan. I said, wow, wasn't that neat? And then that was it until I met Dodge, and he took me out to a Christmas bird count, handed me some binoculars, and we're going to count, count birds. That was back in 1981. So 11 years after he arrived in Panama. This was in the 70s. I started bird watching down here. Here's what we had for information. We had the U.S. bird guides. There was Meyer de Chancy's Birds of South America and Birds of Columbia, none of which had plates, really. And then there was Edwin Blake's Birds of Mexico, which had line drawings. And there was the first three volumes of Wetmore's Birds of Panama. We would read the description in Wetmore and make our own drawings from the description and color them in. And I wish some of these had been saved because they were pretty far off. Wetmore was not real good at, at describing it. It was kind of olive color, but not as olive as in that other species. You know, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> so that's what we did. And then uh, Irby Davis came out with Birds of Central America and Mexico. And it had a picture of all the species. So now we at least knew uh, what the birds looked like, the problem being that he used different names. And so we had made a key to what the names equaled <clears throat> and printed those up, and people that had Davis would stick them in. And then Richard came out with his guide that divided each species account into description, similar species, range, void, you know, followed a system that other authors have followed since then. But he was the he inventor the of that. He was the first person to use that system of, uh, of designing field guides. Before then, they just ramble. Originally, he's probably about my age. And he came down as a young military officer a couple years before me. So he probably came down as a 24. He must, maybe he's a couple years older than me. Anyway, he was down here. Eisenman gave Ridgely all of his notes. The text on Ridgely's book, he'd say, how can a guy only be here for two years? You can't travel much in Panama, especially when you have to How does he know so much? Well, Eisenman gave him his notes. But Ridgely still is strongly admired for that because nobody, even including Eisenman, could read Eisenman's notes. So <laughs> that, that was kind of the joke at the time. Ridgely could read Eisenman's notes. And of course, as you all know from your contact with Bob Ridgely, he's a genius when it comes to birds and remembering de details and data on birds. And, and bird calls. And, yeah, That's he's just phenomenal. When I became aware of its existence in 1971, it was already called Panama Audubon Society. The Panama Audubon Society used to be part of the, used to be a chapter of the Florida. The Florida had made them that because they had contacts down here like Russ Mason, 
Nana Steffi. They bought this cabin up in Bambito, Sonrisas Chiricanas. And that was owned by the Fort Audubon Society. And they needed a local chapter to administer that cabin. These Florida birders would like to come down and stay in Panama up in Cherokee. So we were, a, that's actually how Panama Audubon got started. Before that, from what I understand, it was the Canal Zone Nature Society or something like that. And that entity became Panama Audubon Society through Florida. And then uh, some political reasons in Florida, I believe, are what made them drop us, and they gave the cabin to us. And of course, with the understanding that whenever they wanted to use it, they could. That cabin comes into play a lot because sale of that cabin got us this. Yeah, the office, which was huge. So all these little things from the past, people have come in, it's like, actors coming in at certain points and playing their part to get it going to what it is today, which has been really, really cool. Because it could have died. There were many times when it could have just died. And someone always came in to the, kind of like to the rescue and, and, and believed in the cause so much that they kept it alive. Like us too, like Carl and Roosevelt. I mean, they've kept it going for much longer than we did. They didn't have Audubon Society meetings yet. It was 1972. They had them on the Pacific side, but on the Atlantic side, it was Sierra Club. And as an aside, I might add that I am still a member of Sierra Club because it's the Sierra Club that stopped the highway going through Panama to Colombia. And the way the Sierra Club stopped it was brought suit against the U.S. interest that we're going to finance it because they did not do an environmental impact statement on it, and so they couldn't use American funds. And that's what stopped the highway, Sierra Club. I'd been here about a year. I came, I, was, I worked at Gorgas, see, and then they offered me a job at Coca Solo, so I moved over there, and that was in uh, July of 1971. And right after that, Nate Gale moved down to take over the vet clinic, and Jaime Pujols was already here. He had done a residency at, at Gorgas in the Canal Zone, and now he was on the staff at Coca Solo. And Jaime was a bird watcher, and he uh, was a member of Panama Autumn Society. As soon as Nate came, Nate realized his membership somehow. So I joined. For a while there in the early 70s, Jaime was an acting president. But it was a branch of uh, the Florida Ottoman Society. And there was a bunch of uh, people just interested in birding. Another of the early members was Dr. Frank Smith. He always did that. He always that. did that. He always did that. And had a beer, uh, a cerveza Panama bottle in each pocket of his guayabera. That's how he went birding. There was Bob Jeffries who worked for the canal company. I remember that he took me to a meeting. And that's all I remember. Um, I think it was at the Jewish Center here on the Pacific side. And there were a lot of people. And I was impressed, you know, like, oh, my God, you know, all these people. Uh, nobody. I knew nobody. So, but that was like the first time. And um, then we'd go back to Cologne, because that's where we lived. Then we'd go bird watching. We kept her out until after we knew her. And that was in 1981. And then we tried to dump work on her, but she was pretty effective at avoiding it. But she, after a while, she saw that it could be done so much better. So she decided to get involved. The next thing I remember is they were asking me to do translations for the Panama Audubon. You know, things in English translate them to Spanish. So that's kind of what I started doing. Roger was president then. So people had started yeah. leaving by then. The Americans had started leaving the country because of the, the effects of the treaty. So that's back in 81, 80, 82, 83, 284. Yeah, the treaty was signed in 77, and they started implementation in 79. And then in 81, between 81 and 83 is when the first steps were made, the, the all-important first steps, the Health Bureau. The do Panamanian doctors didn't want the Americans taking care of the Panamanians any longer. They wanted the money. And so they did away with the Health Bureau, and the Army Medical Corps took care of the Americans. Another thing was the 
Canal Zone police was done away with, and the Panamanian police took over police in the, the whole area, things like that. Roger Johnson was a past president that helped keep the society going uh, during this tough transition in the late 70s. I was uh, appointed vice president behind Dennis Sheets, and lo and behold, he had to leave. So I was, I've served out his term and did not run again. And I can't remember if I was relieved by Nate Gale or by Roger Johnson. I just don't remember that. Nate Gale was very instrumental in keeping the society going there in the late 70s. Remember, this used to be a, a club that was an American club. Now we were trying to transform, keep it alive and transform it into something that would still be alive 20 years later, which, through the help of many people, has successfully been done. It took the work of a lot of people. Now, people that need to be mentioned are Norita Scott, who had the vision of trying to get us involved, more integrated with Panama and more environmental work. She and um, Gary Boucher and Bill Adsett. Uh, Charlotte Elton was also involved. So those are the people that were instrumental in moving us to the next phase. Dodge and I kind of like kept things, helped keep things together in order so it would move into the next the next phase. There were some times where it got really iffy. I don't know about when the Americans were just leaving right after the treaty, but during the Noriega years, those were like really bad years. And there were some points that we could hardly have any meetings because driving the roads at night was dangerous. And at least the Kalan people like us, we wouldn't dare to come over because going back in the darkness, you know, we'd be held up. With Bill and Norita at that point in time, they helped transition into doing things more with Panama and getting involved with more activities in Panama. So that was a key piece. Them there was a key piece to get us to where we are now. So we went from Panama Audubon Society to Sociedad Audubon Panama, an NGO. Yeah, and they were instrumental in doing that. It took work, a lot of angst. At that point in time also, originally had come down a couple of times, the book was going to be translated. So funds were obtained to translate the book. And then Gary Boucher then took that over with the book translation. Dana comes and brings some of his paintings he had made just on his own, and Eugene Eisenman was at the meeting. Eugene was visiting Panama then, and he came to our Sierra Club meeting, and he and Dana were talking, and Eugene was giving some hints what was wrong with this juvenile double tooth kite painting and stuff like that. And then Dana and I kind of became friends, and uh, Dana got active in the Audubon Society, and Dana, because he's a good artist, you know, he did the Tucan, he did the paintings for the poster, he's done other things that since we've left, and he's just kind of been a friend of the Audubon Society. The idea for the poster occurred like around 86, 87, 1986, 1987. Of course, that was the height of the Noriega years, the years of basically terror. So we said, okay, let's do something. So we needed to figure out how to do it. We needed, to, we had no money, so we had to get a grant. So find out about getting grants. How are we going to do it? Came up with the idea, went to the Inrenare to get permission, you know, get some funding from them, tell them what I wanted to do, get information on parks, maps, and stuff like that. So it took a lot. But it all came together, a lot of people helped, and we were finally able to produce this poster. Now, the poster was ready, we got someone to do the printing in Colombia, because the printing here wasn't that good. And then the invasion occurred. So, you know, things stopped for a while. And after that, we were able to go ahead and print it, and we printed 5,000 copies for distribution in schools all over the nation. And the idea was, and the public schools, because it was, the idea was to teach kids about nature and, and, and about the existence of national parks and associate birds in national parks and protect the birds. So that's how that started. We knew that the Atlantic side was at risk of being deforestated. So Dodge and I came up with the idea of, okay, how are we going to protect this? I was using Panama Audubon Society as the umbrella organization to help give validity to this request of protecting this area and converting into a national park. So I went to a lot of meetings, spoke to a lot of people, trying to figure this out. And it never worked out, unfortunately. But something came out, uh, Charlotte Elton picked up the ball afterwards, and she's with SEASPA, 
And she was able to then get the people involved in the area and have them do some environmental education there. In order to get birders, teach them about the birds. Somebody had to teach them about the birds. So I came up and made, I created a bird watching class. Because the idea was to get more people interested, educate them, and then we would have more people to do Christmas counts for us. You know, there was a motive. The Christmas count was the big deal. So I was trying to recruit people and train them. The number of bird watchers was dwindling. The number of areas accessible was dwindling. So it was a matter of... After the treaty. After yeah. the treaty. Because they would block things. You know, you couldn't go here, you couldn't go there, or it got destroyed. So it was, you, it took a lot of planning to get this to work. I remember sitting at my office calling up all my contacts in the Panama Canal Commission, the cops, the people in the canal, to get us permission to go into the areas. And okay, so we do that. And how are we going to get more bird watchers involved? So then we tape, I had Dodge, he had made tapes of birds, the most common birds. Okay, get the tape of common birds. We made the tape, sent it out to the birders, study this before the Christmas count so you can identify the birds by call. I mean, we did all kinds of things. Then we said, okay, what are we going to do to get the people to come to Kalan? Well, we fed them, so we started feeding. So that started the Christmas potluck, Christ the Christmas count potluck, where we'd buy, buy the ham and then we'd call up people. What are you going to bring? You know. So and it became it became kind of like a party. So people would come. Derek Scott, Derek Scott dropped in and helped us with the, the dropped in from England. Say, hey, I'm here. Say, well, great, come on in. You know, and you know, got them on the Christmas count. So people would drop in and off we'd go. Get them, send them to the area, and then we'd scout out the area. So the Christmas count was our baby, and. Um, that's kind of like what we did on the Atlantic side. 20 years running, Atlantic side was number one. There were three Christmas counts. There's three weekends that, that you can have Christmas counts. And they, the National Audubon Society gives you this range of dates. We always did the first one on the Pacific side because it, dry season started sooner over here. Then in the Central Park, which was Gamboa and the Pipeline Road, and then the Atlantic side where dry season came last. Each of those three areas, and these areas are immutable. They don't change with time. You could pave the whole thing, and then all you'd be stuck with is a Christmas count area that had house sparrows. See, no, no Christmas count had scored over 300 species of birds until about 1978 or 79 or something. Well, finally, the Atlantic side did it, and we were number one in the year. And then, a couple years later, the Pacific count did it, and the Central count got close. And in fact, up until the invasion, that was a great year for birding down here. The weather was just right and everything. The, the Pacific side did the best of all three counts. Atlantic side, we still got 300, but it, that count occurred after the invasion, so we couldn't go into a lot of areas. The Christmas count on the Pacific side was run by Nate and Ellie, Gale. And the Christmas count in the central part was run by Gary Vache. And the Christmas count on the Atlantic side was run by Dodge and Lorna. We each had our own method on how to do things to make a successful count. Well, all of these three factors were leaving pretty much at the same time. And so it was going to be run by people who had never compiled a Christmas count. And they didn't know the rules of the Christmas count. They didn't know how to go about it efficiently, blah, blah, blah. So Lorna set up Christmas count committee so we could teach them how to run it so it would keep going. Because at that time, we were still number one, you know. We picked like somebody like biology people, like Carla Paricio was one, um, Norma Ponce was one. We passed on all of the knowledge that we had. Uh, we passed on the knowledge of bird calls. Dodge had done tapes over the years and he had, so Dodge had made the most common canal area birds on, on cassettes. It wasn't common. Everybody saw the common birds. It was the birds that if you didn't know the calls, you, they wouldn't get recorded on the, on the count. Okay, well those birds. Well he made the tapes and we would hand those tapes out so, and have people practice up listening to them in their cars and that was the thing. They had to listen to them before the Christmas count. So so we had all this information, we gathered it all, we gathered these guys and we started, and we worked through the, all three Christmas counts together. We took them all through it. Well, in 1995, when we started, somehow we got Carl, we were not living in Panama City, we were neighbors of Carl, we got him roped in. And of course, the way to get people to come to any meeting is to feed them. And we loved to cook, so we'd always cook, and people would come. And then Rosabelle appears, and she gets roped in. 
So here we would have meetings and we'd you know, get people together. We had two single people there, all of a sudden we said, hey, of course I'm a matchmaker. The second year we said, okay, you know, now it's gonna be you, you're gonna be on your own. But by then, Carl and Roosevelt now became an item and Roosevelt really was interested and she started taking over, which was great. And, um, and we had a successful Christmas concert. We still were number, number one that year, 96 and 97. And then after that, when we left in 97, Dodge and I transferred the baton over to Carl and Roosevelt.